This is Mark Lane. This is Robert Groden. This is Dick Russell. This is Jim Mars. This is Dr. David Mantic. This is Cyril Weck. This is Jim DiEugenio. This is Joan Mellon. This is Jerry Polycott. This is Gary Schell. This is Greg Burnham. This is Gerald McKnight. This is Sherry Feaster. This is Doug Horn. This is Bill Pepper. This is Richard Belzer. This is Oliver Stone. This is Governor Jesse Ventura, and you're listening to Black Op Radio. Video computers online. Archiving 44K. T minus 30 seconds. Server connection confirmed. T minus 25 seconds. T minus 20 seconds. Phone lines are go. T minus 15 seconds. T minus 10 seconds. Break check complete. That right up right there, Five. Welcome to Black Op Radio, the voice of political conspiracy research. You're listening to Black Op Radio, the show NSA doesn't want you to hear. Now here is your host, Leno Sanic. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Black Op Radio. This is your host, Len Osanek. Today, we are joined by noted researcher Greg Burnham from San Diego. Hello, Greg. Hi, Len. How are you? Great to uh, hear from you again. I understand it's always sunny in San Diego. It rains a lot in Vancouver, so I always envy talking to people living in these great locations. (laughs) Thanks. Yeah, I wish I could take credit for it, but I can't. We were... uh commenting how, how warm it's been here even for san diego it's been relatively warm so we're very fortunate great now what i'd like to do today is talk about some of the things that are new and uh i'll start off with one thing new at black op radio is a twitter feed uh i am signed up for twitter now so if you want to follow uh get updates from whatever news is happening at black op radio you can do that you can also subscribe to an email list which i send out for only I don't send it out very often because I hate getting junk email but if I have you know something special like Oliver Stone or some new video or something I'll put that out but I guess there'll be weekly announcements you know on the Twitter feed of who's on and uh, things like that so do sign up for that it's on the main page everyone now with yourself you have a new website that you've been working on let's um, promote that and tell me a little bit about it sure and you know I want to make one comment too on, uh, on on Twitter what you just mentioned you know, I was always reluctant to, to do anything with social media, and I haven't done anything personally with social media. But I think it's important for us, um, quote unquote, older researchers, to remember that we do need the participation of young people in this effort because as uh, we get older and as some of us pass on, if there's nobody left to carry the torch, well, then the torch just goes out. So I think it's important. And, and young people do communicate with each other and to the world um, through these different you know, social media outlets. So I think it's good that you do have the Twitter account. And I do as well now for the website. We've got a Facebook account, Twitter account, and a YouTube channel. Uh, Google Plus, Google Circles, and things like that. So, you know, it's a little bit strained for for somebody in my generation maybe to always uh, be all over that, but I think it's something that's necessary if we want to involve the next generation. Speaking of which, um, the new website is assassinationofjfk.net. You don't need a www before that, just HTTP. Um, And it is uh, my new website. Um, It is loaded with information. uh, as you know, Len, um, my study revolved uh, a lot around, obviously, the JFK administration, um, and uh, a big part of it had to do with his management of crisis. Um, so the Bay of Pigs is prominently uh, discussed on uh, my website, uh, including some of the presentations that I've done on the subject, and uh, the information, of course, that I gleaned from the late Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty, who was a a uh, extremely rich source of information, somebody who was there and uh, so who knew who, what he was talking about. And my other big focus, of course, is the Vietnam War and the National Security Action Memorandums that JFK had written that was going to extricate us from that uh, 
that mess that was going on there. So that's also prominently featured, as well as many uh, articles written by some very fine researchers like uh, Doug Horn. Uh, we've also got a YouTube channel there featuring uh, uh, John Costello's work on the Zapruder film, uh, among others. So there's uh, a, lot, a lot of stuff going on. And also a lot of interviews that I conducted with uh, Jerry Hemming, the late Jerry Hemming, Jerry Patrick Hemming. And uh, that's all featured there as well. So uh, it'd be great if people would uh, visit. And there's a comment section under all of the various articles and things so people can participate and give their input and, uh, and whatnot. So that's a brand new, uh, brand new website. Okay, great. Well, one of the things I did want to discuss today was uh, you have a link there to your good uh, review of uh, National Security Action Memorandum 263 and 273, which you gave in Dallas, I believe, at a COPA at 2010. And uh, I thought it was very well done, and I thought we should talk about that again today. Um, you know, the, the good thing about this, the, the good thing is that a few other forums and that have been kind of infiltrated by people who are alone, uh, assassin, you know, uh, proponent or whatever, you know, like just a, uh, you know, th these two worlds don't intersect anywhere, you know. It's like yeah. if you believe the Warren Commission, you've got to sit with your own little circle of friends because the people who don't believe it, what we're doing is we're investigating the failings of it and to see what we can discover from this investigation so as people have looked into acoustical evidence or or x-rays or medical evidence or the root or all the different people who investigated it they've already said listen it's a given there's something wrong with the warren commission and we don't believe a lone gunman uh can shoot i mean you you know killed off you know he's pointing from the front you know how how can you get hit from the back from the front you know was a great quote from that day i think yes so um People have got to give in that something wrong happened, and it's our investigation of, of how the media has perpetrated this continuation of the fraud, I think, of the fraud of the Warren Commission, which uh, led me to make the 50 Reasons video that I, I did last year. I mean, it was week after week, another episode just showing on the 50th anniversary how it can't be true. Now, among the researchers, uh, some things we don't agree with, and it's a real shame that some people use this as a rallying cry to, I don't know, fragment the community. Me and you have discussed many things, and we may agree or disagree, and we just say, leave it. Hmm, well, I'll have to look into that further. But um, mm -hmm. other people have said, well, if you don't agree with this, for instance, if you don't agree with this photo, then, you know, forget you. And I was just making a reference to the, the people who are in the Oswald is Innocence campaign. It's like their whole campaign is, listen, everybody in the community uh, pretty well feels that Oswald is innocent. I don't know why you have to kind of fragment the community, say you're either with us on this thing or you're against us, right? And I think that's a real failing. COPA and, and the, the lecture you gave, I think a lot of us are really trying to say, listen, if you're interested in this, here's the information we have discovered. And through Fletcher Prouty or other people, this is what is the groundwork for it. So let's go forward. Mm -hmm. um, the, that's the good thing with your website. I think the only failing is that if we have too many forums – It'll be, I don't think people will know where to go. Now, the one good one was Rich De La Rosa, which you for years were with, with him. He's passed away now. But that's a forum that uh, all sorts of people uh, of, of many varying views went to. Lately, there was the John Simkin Forum, and yet somehow they have allowed people in that want to, you know, parrot that the Warren Commission was correct. And it's almost as if it's a kind of a time-wasting thing. They should just have, here's a forum. If you believe Lee Oswald was guilty and, you know, the Warren Commission was correct, well, the you know, the three or four of you can go there and pat each other in the back. But for the yeah. hundreds and thousands of people who don't agree, it's as if these guys are just there to infiltrate these forums and, and muddy the waters. And in the case of McAdams, he'll have a blatant lie. He's just lying, and people will correct him. And, he, oh, yeah, you're correct. Okay. And then months later, he goes back to the same old lie. Sure, yeah. Well, you know something? I did decide to uh, announce on your show today, and now that you've kind of brought up forums, I guess I'll go ahead and do that. I did start a forum as well connected to the website. And what we're going to do, in fact, we'll do right now, is add a button just for your listeners, because I haven't launched the forum officially yet, but just for your listeners, if you go to assassinationofjfk.net website, 
go ahead and scroll down to the bottom of the opening page. And on the bottom right side, you'll see, I guess it'll be an orange button. And it's going to say something to the effect of private invitation for BOR listeners only. And that way, just the folks that are listening to this program will know that the button's there. Other people will see it. They won't know what it means, though. But it'll say private invitation and click on that button because there's not a button on the top of the forum yet. You know, I mean, on top of the website that says forum yet because we haven't officially launched. So listeners, just scroll to the bottom of the page, right side. There'll be a button that says for Black Op Radio you know, private invitation, click on that, that'll bring you to the forum, and then you can sign in there, and you can uh, read what we've already got going, you can post to it as well. I do ask that everyone use their real name, we don't accept aliases, you know, or screen names of any kind, your, your, your true first and last name, as well as a valid email address. Would, you know, it, would, yeah, I would, think on the Simkin forum, you had to have a photo as well, which... You know, I remember there was some problems with David Von Peen or those guys. They didn't want to give a photo. They didn't want to give their real name. It's like, listen, if you want to come in here and talk to scholars, people who are spending time really going over this, at least use your real name or go play in somebody else's sandbox, you know? Right. There you go. (laughs) Yeah, well, we've we've already got quite a bit up on the forum. I should also mention that uh, we have some very good founding members that decided that they would go with me on this journey and uh, assist me. The founding members are John Costello, of course, the physicist from Australia, Charles Drago, a good friend of mine, who's a very articulate speaker as well as a has some very deep political insights to offer to the case. He worked a lot with the late Evika. Also, Phil Dragu, who, you know, if you recall, uh, JFK used to quote and say that uh, where power corrupts, poetry cleanses. And uh, Phil Dragu is a wonderful artist and a wonderful poet, as well as a very insightful individual regarding political assassinations. So he is also a founding member. Phil Giuliano, as well, from the old Rich Della Rosa Forum, who is also a founding member there, has joined us as well. So I really am anxious to hear what he has to say. Douglas Horn, everyone's familiar with, I'm sure, as well. He was the chief analyst for military records for the Assassinations Record Review Board. He's one of our founding members, as well as Dr. David Mantic, a good friend of mine. And another good friend, Stan Wilburn, who's also acting as our webmaster and has so much to contribute. He was also on the Rich Della Rosa site. So between those founding members, we've got a lot going as well. And a lot of other folks have already started to join. We're sending out private invitations, and now we've opened it up to the uh, Black Op Radio listeners. And we'll be fully launched, hopefully, in the next week, eh, maybe a week, roughly, from now. So so that's the forum. So, uh, And you, know, you made some good points about it as well. You know, One of the, the things on our forum that's a bit different, when we started the JFK Research Assassination Forum with Rich back in 1998 because the internet was so new and because people, you know, a a lot of folks, when they were polled, obviously did not believe the Warren report from the very beginning. I mean, it's never had close to a majority of people believing in it. But there was not a way that was easily accessible for people to actually research the subject themselves. Unless you had a real passion for it, you'd have to spend hours and hours at a library. If you really wanted to get into the nitty gritty, you'd have to, you know, perhaps even travel to Washington, D.C. to the National Archives to act, you know, to do some really in-depth research. And a lot of people just did not have the resources for this and did not have reasonable access. So when the internet first was born and people were getting on all these different, you know, chat rooms and news groups and this and that and the other. There was a whole lot of, you know, chaos and mayhem going on there, a lack of decorum, for lack of a better word. So one of the things that Rich had done when he built the forum, and we enforced this for the entire years that it was open, was that it was quote unquote, a no flame zone, meaning that no personal attacks were allowed. Well, of course, I've adopted that on the new forum. A person can come, share their research, and not have to be afraid that they're going to be subject to undue ridicule or criticism. Obviously, we don't want people on there just patting everybody's back. So, you know, it's fine to challenge people's findings and theories as long as it's done in a respectful way. And the other thing that's important, I think, now that 16 years has passed, you know, in terms of, of the internet being very accessible to to people since our first forum, we don't find it necessary to even entertain the idea or argument of Lee Harvey Oswald or anyone else for that matter as quote unquote the lone assassin. So back 16 years ago, it was appropriate to allow that debate to go on. We don't find that debate to be helpful at all in the discovery of truth today in 2014. So one of the rules of engagement on our forum is there is no talk of Lee Harvey Oswald as the lone assassin 
And so those are just a couple of the parameters, but I think most of the listeners on your show would be astute enough to appreciate us not entertaining that kind of nonsense because it's just really kind of a waste of time. So that gives you a little background on the forum, where it came from, you know, the foundation. If you, your, your listeners log on, go to the where it says, welcome to the forum, read the mission statement, read the policy statement, and I think you'll get a real good feel for, for where we're coming from. Yeah, because I, one thing is that even amongst the well-respected researchers, there's some disagreements, and sure. people don't agree with some things, and for some people, I, I have no problem with that. I'm going to have to have a few more shows on with John Costella and problems with the Zapruder film, but when I have Robert Groden on, he says that, you know, that's the, the way the film was. He got it. There's nothing done to it, and other other view is... There's something wrong with it. So, you know, I don't hold anything against Robert Groden or John Costella. Now, you know, I'd I like to hear both sides, and we'll just discuss it nicely. You know, I don't really subscribe to James Files being an assassin, but yet uh, James Files may have been there. It's not even his name, but I don't have, hold anything against Wim Dankbar and his form, JFK Murder Solved. I don't really like the name, and that's just a little idiosyncrasy. I mean, you know, you pick a name, but... I think that when you stay, you have a name called JFKMurderSolved.com, there's a bit of an onus to really back it up. And But anyway, as far as being yeah. a, a researcher who's honestly looking for where the truth lies, I think Wim's done a, a lot of good work, you know. And certainly he's had some good debates with uh, uh, Gary Mack and bringing up the fallacies of the Sixth Floor Museum. So here's the problem. There's, there's a disinformation campaign out there, which is totally like, you know, McAdams and Gary Mack in the Sixth Floor, which is just total disinfo. And then there's the other people who come to whatever uh, disagreement. And one being, I think, that maybe Jim DiEugenio is um, quite accepting of everything John Newman says, and I might be a little more skeptical from my time with Fletcher. You know, I think that Jim has said that he's not sure that uh, Ed Lansdale is in Dealey Plaza. I got a letter from Fletcher. He had several letters. He gave me one of them. One of them was from Victor Krulak, General Victor Krulak, very high up in the Pentagon. He wrote a letter saying, well, of course, that's Lansdale. So what in the world is he doing there? You know, that's an interesting question, and I'm paraphrasing. But, that you know, that's the thing. I, I say, well, if Newman is a researcher and he has doubts, fair enough. I talked to somebody who actually was there in the Pentagon working on That's good enough for me, and I don't have anything against uh, Jim DiEugenio or John Newman or, you know, I, I mean— People have varying degrees until they come across something that changes their mind. I think you were sure. telling me a story one time about Jerry Hemming, mm -hmm. and he was saying he was uh, leery that uh, Ed Lansdale was in Dealey Plaza. Do you want to? Bring... Yeah, there, and I hadn't been in on the conversation initially, um, but apparently on one of the forums, I believe it was, Jerry had denied that uh, Krulak had ever said anything to the effect of Lansdale being in Dilly Plaza, and he was pretty vehement about it, you know. And so somebody that knows me emailed me and knew, knew that I had a really good relationship with both uh, Jerry Patrick Hemming and with Colonel Prouty. So they emailed me and they said, you know, Hemming's, you know, <laughs> commenting on how there's no way that Lansdale was in Dilly Plaza, and I thought you might want to know that. So I called Jerry up on the phone and I said, hey, you know, and so we had a discussion about it. And, uh, and I told him, look, you know, I've got a copy of a letter from Prouty to Krulak and Krulak back to Prouty. And they're, you know, discussing the fact, not if it's Lansdale, but that Lansdale was there. And Krulak acknowledges it by saying, what in the world was Ed Lansdale doing there? And Jerry was, you know, he's saying, what? Are you kidding me? There's really, he, he said that? And I said, yeah. And he said, do you mind, you know, sending me? So I sent Jerry the text of it, you know, so that he could read it for himself. And then Jerry basically rescinded what he had said, you know. It's been a long time since that particular thing happened, so I'm not going to, you know, try to recount it exactly. But that's general. No, I think the that, idea is that yeah. someone had doubts about something, and then you well, showed him a document, and he said, oh, well, I stand corrected. You yeah, know, and, like, Jerry, uh, yeah. and Jerry knew Krulak, you know, and Jerry respected Krulak. A lot. So when he saw this from the horse's mouth, Jerry pretty much accepted the fact, in his own view, that Lansdale was in Dealey Plaza because Krulak would never have written such a thing if, you know, he didn't know Prouty as well, you know. I don't think he ever met Prouty, but he knew of Prouty. Yeah. But he knew Krulak, you know, and he respected Krulak. So there, in Jerry's mind, Lansdale was in Dilly Plaza because Krulak confirmed it. Right. Yeah. Also, researchers have found that Ed Lansdale stayed in the Hotel Texas, I believe it is, where Kennedy stayed he, a week before he was there uh, scoping out the location. 
So that's of great interest. And one thing I should say that is also new, I have totally revamped the Colonel Proudy CD-ROM where it's on a DVD-ROM disc now. So where I can only fit 700 megs on it, now I have uh, 4, 4.45 gigs. Oh yeah, I've added a lot more video to the uh, the Colonel Proudy, and it's a direct download. So if anyone's interested at all in um, these letters between Victor Krulak and and uh, Fletcher and Fletcher between Oliver Stone and all the other things, and I have it for a direct download, and it's a lot of video, hours and hours of video on it now. Well, that's great. I mean, I remember the very first one that you made way, way back, and uh, it was incredible then. It would still be incredible now if that's the only thing that somebody had, but it's hard to imagine how far we've come technology-wise that you can have four gigs of, uh, of information, but uh, good for you, Len. That's yeah. terrific. Now, let's talk a little bit about these figures because Fletcher Prouty and Colonel uh, General Victor Krulak played a role in... NSAM-263, and that's National Security Action Memorandum. And for people who don't know what that is, you might have seen the Oliver Stone film, but that is a statement basically saying, we've done all the legwork we're going to do. We've analyzed it on recommendations of a report we're going to withdraw from Vietnam. We're pulling out, and this is all U.S. personnel, not just military, not uh, servicemen advisors, uh, you know, uh, helicopter crews, personnel. We're, We're pulling everybody out. Let's start with 1,000 troops a month. It'll be by the end of 64. And the interesting thing is, the first thing that President Johnson signed is, we're going back into Vietnam. We're going to help them to win. And, um, you know, it's as if Mm -hmm. the whole thing was back on. You go over this quite eloquently in your uh, short presentation, but I thought we have time just to elaborate a little bit on it. First of all, what was your interest in, in National Security Action Memorandum 263? This is a... You know, kind of a paperwork. uh... Yeah, there's a couple things. I think one of the things that drew my attention to that document, obviously, was Colonel Prouty because it had such great significance. And let me read something briefly for your audience that that Colonel Prouty had sent to me in in a letter. And because it's very apropos and it's very short, what I'm covering here. Quote, the national security policy of the United States is defined by a series of very special, highly classified documents. The name or general terminology associated with these types of documents changes from administration to administration, but they carry essentially the same weight. For Truman, they were called National Security Council Intelligence Directives, for example. For Kennedy, they were termed National Security Action Memoranda. The key idea in these documents and the others with various names that were selected over the years is the preservation of national security. All of these are presidential directives, just like an executive order is, but the type designated for national security carries special weight. They trump every other presidential document, end quote. So it's real important because I've had people argue with me before that and I'm going to shorten it to an NSAM, NSAM, an NSAM, National Security Action Memorandum, is, you know, it's not that big a deal, which kind of sounds ludicrous for somebody even to make that claim. I mean, you just listen to the name of the document, National Security Action Memorandum. You know, that doesn't sound like a note you're passing in class. But some people would have you believe that. But the point to all this is that, so when a president, in this case Kennedy, signs the National Security Action Memorandum, it has one drawn up. He's not doing it on a whim. This isn't something that he's writing every day. This is something, you know, Kennedy once mentioned in, in a press conference, and again, I'm paraphrasing, someone asked him a question about, you know, now that he's been in office for a while, what does he think of being the president? You know, would he recommend the job to anybody else? And is it more difficult than he thought and whatnot? And he made a comment that was interesting that basically where he said that everything that comes across the president's desk is basically critical because if it's not, it's handled at a much lower level. So everything the president you know, has to handle is extremely important, extremely sensitive items. So a national security action memorandum, you know, I would say you'd classify as the most critical of all the critical things that the president is dealing with because he's not writing national security action memorandums over everything not over everything he sees, see? So these are very, very special documents. So when we just talk about, 
you know, Vietnam, I think one thing that's important for people to realize is that we were in Vietnam for a lot longer than most people realize. It didn't start, you know, in 1960, you know, or in 1954. You know, we were there a lot longer than that. That's the first thing. And people should also realize, and again, you know, in the short time that you and I have here today, I'm not going to be able to cover all this, but I'll just uh, throw it out there and people can do some of their own research. And eventually I'll have some of this up on our, uh, more of this up on the website as well. But Kennedy was opposed to any involvement by the United States in Vietnam way back in the early 50s. He gave several speeches on it uh, where he basically was urging, you know, President Eisenhower uh, to ig not, I won't say so much to ignore Secretary of State John Foster Dulles's recommendation that we get involved in Vietnam, pretty much really urging the Secretary to rethink this thing and to not get us involved because the French had their hands full with it while they were there unsuccessfully and that we would be unsuccessful as well and that you can't force, uh, you know, you can't force freedom on a people that don't want your brand of freedom. You know, this was up to the, the Vietnamese people. So this wasn't, this wasn't rhetoric that Kennedy was saying after he became president, you know, or just, you know, towards the end of, of his, uh, his time in office before he was assassinated. This philosophy of his went way back, you know, a decade or more prior to his ever even running for office uh, or running for the presidency anyway. His anti-Vietnam involvement was there for a long, long time. So once he was president and once he was, you know, found himself in the, in the political climate of the day, it was important for him to not come across any softer on communism than he was already being painted, you know, by the ultra conservative right wing. We're already campaigning, painting him as soft on communists. So he had to, you know, balance this politically um, in order to withdraw from Vietnam, which was his intent. And we know that was his intent for a lot of different reasons. The first indicator, besides the ones that I just gave, besides the ones where he, for, for a decade, had been uh, preaching or giving speeches against involvement, besides that, while he was president, he took some very definitive steps towards coming out of Vietnam. Um, one of them, he sent General Krulak, who we were just talking about, as well as uh, a foreign service officer from the State Department named Mendenhall. He sent both of them to Vietnam on September 6th of 63 to, do a, to go on a fact-finding mission. But again, keep in mind, Kennedy already knew what direction he was going in. He already knew that he needed to come out of, that we needed to extricate ourselves from Vietnam. What he needed to do, however, in order to, to accomplish that, he wasn't going to be able to do it in a month, you know. He was going to need to get reelected in order to finish it, to complete the withdrawal. So he had to balance this whole thing by doing what? Well, if he was able to get a recommendation from his own military, the top brass of his own military, get a recommendation from them suggesting that, yes, we can and should get out of Vietnam, it would be very difficult then for his political opponents to claim that he was doing this because he was soft on communism. Well, what, are you going to claim that, you know, General Maxwell Taylor, right, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, he's soft on communism? Well, nobody would have done that because he obviously, he's not, see. So what Kennedy did is he started off with having uh, the commandant of the Marine Corps, Victor Krulak, along with uh, Mendenhall from the State Department, go off to Vietnam on a fact-finding tour. And while they were gone, he had already decided that he was going to withdraw from Vietnam and he just needed to have a report written to reflect that. So when Krulak and Mendenhall came back, they reported to him and Mendenhall was very kind of negative. He was saying, because of the people that he talked to that were mostly related to uh, State Department people, and Krulak talked to military people. And Krulak came back and was optimistic and said that it looked like we would be able to come out of Vietnam. We would be able to train the Vietnamese to take over the effort of any kind of insurgencies that, that they needed to deal with without very much American help at all. We could leave some advisors, but we could pull out all of the military by the end of 64 and pull out all personnel, all personnel by the end of 65. That was what Krulak's recommendation was. So when Mendenhall came back and Krulak came back, Kennedy looked at the both of them and said, what, did you guys visit the same country? Because it sounded like they had, you know, completely two different trips. So we know that Kennedy took Krulak's recommendation 
to heart. And that's because why? Well, that was the direction Kennedy wanted to go anyway. And it was the military's view that it actually was very doable, very doable. So in order to get this done, as I mentioned, Kennedy needed to get the recommendation of his top brass in the military so that he would not himself be accused of being soft on communism. So he took, uh, he sent, I'm sorry, uh, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara and the Chairman of the Joint Chief Staff of Staff uh, Maxwell Taylor, and he sent them on another fact-finding mission to Vietnam in October. While they were gone on their mission to Vietnam, he then uh, had Victor Krulak and Colonel Prouty and their offices. Their, they had, I think, believe 16 secretaries that Prouty said were working you know, t around the clock, 24 hours a day. Sometimes they were all sleep, you know, sleeping in the offices on the couches to get this work done. And they were writing a report that was going to describe all kinds of different conditions in Vietnam, a lot of things that were, in a sense, a bit irrelevant to what Kennedy was trying to do, but in order to make it look like a complete report when in fact the only portion of the report that Kennedy really needed was the part that was going to recommend a withdrawal from Vietnam. And so what Kennedy did is he had Prouty and Krulax and, and their staff write up this report, bind it in leather, and put on it, and it said, you know, the McNamara Taylor Trip Report from their mission. And then Prouty had an officer fly it by jet, to Hawaii because, as you know, when people were coming back from Vietnam, typically they would stop in Hawaii and then, you know, and then complete their trip to Washington, D.C. after that. So this officer met the Secretary of Defense McNamara and the uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Taylor and handed them this leather-bound report that had their name on it and told them, you need to read your report so that you know what's in it when you get back to Washington and present it to the president. So this is some of the history that most people, you're not going to read that anywhere, but how do we know it's true? Well, one of the authors of the report was Colonel Prouty, the person who sent the officer in the jet, give it to the Secretary of Defense, you know, was sent by Prouty. See? So we know this information is correct. We also know that when you look at National Security Action Memorandum, you realize that, again, Folks, remember the gravity of this type of a document, a National Security Action Memorandum. When you open it up and you read the text to it, it's a very, very short document. It only, other, other than the lines where it says, you know, who it's going to in the subject, there's only one, two, three sentences in the whole thing, okay? So it's not a long document. And I'll read it because it's so short. It says, at a meeting on October 5, 1963, the president considered the recommendations contained in the report of Secretary McNamara and General Taylor on their mission to South Vietnam. Now, I'm going to pause. Again, recall this report that it's referring to. Secretary McNamara and General Taylor, they didn't even write it. It was written for them. Okay? Now, here's the second sentence of NSAM 263. It says, the president approved the military recommendations contained in Section 1B, Paragraph 1 to 3 of the report. Now, I'm going to pause again. Okay. In order to know what that means, Section 1B, you have to then go to the McNamara-Taylor report, okay, which is a rather long report. But the section that's referred to here in National Security Action Memorandum 263 is only talking about withdrawing from Vietnam for the most part. There's a couple of logistical items in it. They want to increase a couple of uh, the military tempo in parts of in some of the areas. But the key area is a program be established to train Vietnamese so that essential functions now performed by the U.S. military personnel can be carried out by Vietnamese by the end of 1965. It should be possible to withdraw the bulk of U.S. personnel by that time. OK, so the point to the story is this. NSAM 263 is a very, very short document, and in the second sentence of it, it refers to the McNamara Teller Report, and that is the only portion of that report that was approved by the president, and that's the portion that deals with, with withdrawing from Vietnam.
Okay, so that document was signed on October 11th, 1963, of NSAM 263, and that was Kennedy's withdrawal policy from Vietnam. That's where where it all started. If you recall, three weeks to the day after this document was signed, the president of Vietnam, Diem, was assassinated along with his brother. Most people don't realize this, but that was in the wee hours, you know, midnight, roughly wee hours of the morning that that occurred, uh, Washington time, off the top of my head, the time's right. And General Ed Lansdale of the CIA, well, U.S. Air Force, he was a general of the Air Force, but he's also CIA, retired almost immediately within hours of the Diem assassination. And then three yeah, weeks Yeah, that was his, day, his cover job. He was a CIA agent. His uniform was an Air Force general, colonel and general. And, of course, yeah. Fletcher Prouty on the CD-ROM goes into how he got uh, Lansdale promoted. Yes. And then three weeks to the day after uh, the DMs were assassinated, or DM was assassinated, uh, then and Kennedy was assassinated. That leads us, of course, to another document. But I, I think I should mention something, too, before I get, get to that, unless you had something that you wanted to, to uh, mention, Len, in between here. Uh, no, no, I'm just listening in, yeah. A, a curious thing happened back in 2010, maybe it was beginning of 2010, I think, or end of 2009, it could have even been. Um, I was writing a paper on um, a related topic, and I was looking, I I couldn't remember off the top of my head, of course, the sentence that I just read to you from uh, National Security Action Memorandum 263, and I needed it verbatim for the thing I was writing. And so I had a new computer, and I didn't have some of the files on there that I needed. So I just went to Google, you know, and I typed in NSAM263. And so, boom, you know, it pops up at the page. And I noticed that uh, the Lancer website, of course, popped up either at the top or close to the top. So I clicked on it, and sure enough, it, it popped up, and it had the document there, the, a copy of the document. And then it also had the text of the document. But the funny part of it was, and it's actually it's not so funny, is at the end of the text of the document, without barely even a break, there was text of another document printed directly below it. And I I looked at that and I thought to myself, because I'm very familiar with these documents, I I looked at it and I said, wait a minute, that's not a part of of NSAM 263, what's this? I start reading it and it, it says National Security Action Memorandum number and then there's a, a line it's not even filled in. And it's, then it says it's a draft. And I'm like, wait a minute. That look. And lo and behold, I'm reading it, and what is it? Well, it's the draft of National Security Action Memorandum 273. Well, 273 is the document that reverses Kennedy's policy. And it was signed by Lyndon Baines Johnson on November 26th, four days after Kennedy was dead. And I looked at that, and I go, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. They've got this all mixed up here. They've got the correct... NSAM 263 text right here, and then, that, and then following it, they've got the text from the policy that reversed Kennedy's policy as though it belongs to the same document. And I'm thinking, well, how the heck did they get that wrong? That's like, this is huge history. This is central to what we talk about all the time about a distortion of history. Now, you know, I emailed Deborah at Lancer, and I informed her of it, and she said, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that was that way, and you know, can you help me fix it after a period of time? She, she asked me to help her fix it, so I did. So I wrote a, an introduction to it and, and fixed all that. And then I followed it up with an introduction to National Security Action Memorandum 273, the draft, okay, and I'll say why that's important in a second. The reason I bring this up is that before I came on the show today, because I knew we were going to talk about this, I you know, used Google again, and I picked a different one because I know it's fixed on Lancer. And another one that I picked was the Federation of American Sci- Scientists, right? This is a, a very popular website. It's very reputable. It, it, it gets a lot of things right. You know, you get information there that's pretty clean. It's not, uh, it doesn't seem to be agenda-driven. And they had the exact same mistake on their website as Lancer had had four years ago when I caught it on Lancer. See? And so if a student of the history here who doesn't know what to look for, who doesn't realize that this is an error, 
goes on Google or wherever and tries to find something out. Maybe they're doing a project for school, you know? Maybe it's a junior in high school and their project is the Kennedy assassination, or maybe it's America's history in Vietnam or whatever it might be. And so they go stumbling into this misinformation and they'll get a completely distorted view of what was actually going on. Because the National Security Action Memorandum 273 does the exact opposite of what Kennedy's intentions were at the time that he was assassinated. And the thing that's so important about the draft of NSAM 273 is that it was written the day before Kennedy was even dead. It was drafted on, on November 21st, 63, by his national security advisor, McGeorge Bundy. Actually, back then they called it the uh, special assistant on national security for the president, McGeorge Bundy. Now, for people who don't know this, let me go back again a little bit. Remember I mentioned that Kennedy issued NSAM 263, a top secret document, okay? So there was no announcement, no formal public announcement made that we were pulling out of Vietnam. Obviously, there's a reason for that. Some of it's political. JFK was no fool. He knew that uh, he did not need to be getting you know, campaign shots at him prematurely by making his intentions completely known. We also know, as I mentioned, that on November 1st, Diem was assassinated, okay? So some people might say to themselves, well, because Diem was assassinated, that may have influenced Kennedy. He may have changed his mind about if we needed to be involved in Vietnam or not. And that's demonstrably false, okay? That's, that is not the case. And the reason we know it's not the case is there's a, a lot of different layers. But one way that we know is there was no surprise to anybody that there was going to be a change of government in Vietnam. Okay, That is not to say that Kennedy was to blame in any way for the assassination of Diem and his brother. But we know that there was a very strained relationship between the United States and the government of South Vietnam during that time because... Diem had become very tyrannical. He'd become very oppressive of, uh, of the uh, people of South Vietnam, particularly the monks, the, the Buddhist monks, among others. And the generals there had been itching to overthrow him for quite some time. And they were getting some uh, encouragement from members of the CIA and our State Department, among others. So it's not as though Kennedy was not aware that their days were probably numbered as you know, president of the country. He knew that, you know, he knew that one way or another, the DMs probably would not be allowed to rule Vietnam for very much longer by whatever means it occurred. So when they were assassinated, although that was not what Kennedy's intent was, the fact that they were no longer the leaders of Vietnam really would have had no bearing on whether we were going to be there or not, because that had already been equationed in, factored into the equation, rather, of our plans to withdraw from Vietnam. So that's the first consideration. The second consideration that confirms what I just said is that there was a Honolulu conference planned for the 20th of November in 1963. You know, these type of conferences took place regularly back then they, where they would discuss different aspects of, of things going on in government. It could be uh, domestic, it could be foreign affairs, in this case, Vietnam. And there was a cable... It's called the Honolulu Conference Cable that was sent out on November 13th. And the cable instructs the participants as to what they are to discuss during this conference. So you'd think if this, you know, this quote unquote theory that, uh oh, the DMs are dead now and Kennedy changed his mind. And that's what caused McGeorge Bundy to write this new National Security Action Memorandum 273 which is in completely diametrically opposed to Kennedy's Vietnam withdrawal policy. The reason that was done is because Kennedy was second guessing himself once the DMs were no longer president. Okay. Well, this cable basically now that's not what happened. How do we know? Well, it's dated November 13th. So it's been almost two weeks since the DMs were assassinated. When I say the DMs, that's improper because DM is actually the first name. So, but DM and his brother were assassinated. So this is two weeks later, all right? And this cable is still telling them what's to be discussed at the conference. 
And the second item in the cable says military, and that says including report on progress and accomplishment of tasks assigned as a result of the McNamara-Taylor mission. Okay, well, what were the tasks assigned? Say, well, what was the part that was approved by the president? If you recall, we just said, right? In NSAM 263, the only part that was approved to the McNamara-Taylor mission was the part relating to the withdrawal from Vietnam. That's what they were supposed to be discussing. Okay, and then item D in the cable of November 13th says, outline in terms of forces, timing, and number involved the projected program for reduction of U.S. military forces by the end of calendar year 1965. So again, even this cable, two weeks after the change in government occurred in Vietnam, there's no indication in this cable that they're supposed to be going to Honolulu to discuss, you know, an increased escalation of forces in Vietnam and, and more commitment by the United States into Vietnam. No, it's exactly the opposite. The cable is completely in line with NSAM 263 calling for withdrawal. In the meantime, the DMs are removed from office. Two weeks later, the cable still is confirming we're withdrawing from Vietnam, and this is what you're to discuss when you go to Honolulu. Okay? So now, seven days later, the conference comes up on the 20th and, uh, and 21st. And we know that Kennedy was on a whirlwind trip with Jackie to Texas to mend some political fences, as it were. Um, we know that Kennedy, you know, uh, needed the South to, to win in 1963. We know he was becoming more and more aggressive with his civil rights policies in the United States. So he was probably going to get a lot of the minority vote here. But at what cost, you know? Was he going to lose some of the, the South along the way? So this was a, a big concern. So you go and you try to get as many votes as you can and, and not lose anybody. And so you go to Texas. It's one of the things, I guess, that you do. And um, so they had an extremely tight schedule. They weren't going to be there long. They were only there for a day, you know. So, well, I guess a, a day and a half, you know. So, um, you know, there's not a lot of time here for him to uh, correspond with the people at the Honolulu conference while he's in Texas, he, and if any, the researchers among us know, if you, you can go and you can look at his daily calendar, you can see how tight his schedule was in Texas. And this is an important point. So we know that the conference ended on the 20th, maybe part of the you know, people still leaving on the morning of the 21st. So McGeorge Bundy drafts this document that eventually became NSAM 273, and it reverses Kennedy's policy. And the problem with it is it was drafted the day before JFK was even dead by his national security action, I mean, by his national security advisor. And if a person were to research it and you go and you try to find out, you know, what was actually discussed at the Honolulu conference that could have possibly led to them reversing Kennedy's policy without consulting the president first. I mean, this is critical to this whole thing. I mean, even in the, uh, in the document itself, in NSM 273, it starts off with the sentence, the president has reviewed the discussions of South Vietnam, which occurred in Honolulu, et cetera, et cetera, and has discussed the matter further with Ambassador Lodge. Well, well what president are you talking about here? You see, on the 21st, it couldn't have been JFK. He was on a whirlwind trip in Texas, and you guys were in Honolulu. He didn't talk to anybody about this. There's absolutely no record whatsoever. Now, we know, however, that he did not talk to Lodge in D.C. We know who talked to Lodge. Well, we have that record. Right. Kennedy was supposed to meet with Lodge after he got back to D.C. Instead, LBJ met with Lodge when he got back to D.C. Okay, that's what actually happened. So it's curious to me that McGeorge Bundy was able to, you know, it's worth mentioning, JFK and LBJ were very different people. I mean, it's arguably the case that JFK only had LBJ on the ticket to begin with so that he could possibly get the South to vote for him. You know, he needed the state of Texas, you know. He wasn't going to have any trouble with New England, but boy, he sure needed the southern states. So he had LBJ on the ticket, not because they saw eye to eye on things, not because they were, you know, political uh, allies. No, no, no. Not because they were, you know, beer drinking buddies. No, it was a politically expeditious move only. 
And so once he was vice president, there is, it's no great secret here that these guys were not friends. It's no great secret that they did not get along. There's no great secret that they butted heads and didn't see things the same way as the other one did. There was a lot of conflict there. And so I always found it amazing that once JFK had set us in motion to withdraw from Vietnam, and he was so particular, uh, particular about the way that he had these type of documents drawn up, that the day before he's even dead, and we know the central object of the United States regards Vietnam at that point was to withdraw within a year to two year period of time. It's amazing to me that his national security advisor could draw up another document that is going in the opposite direction of JFK's policy and could write it in such a manner that he just nails it for the guy coming in, LBJ. How is that possible? Because there's no changes really to NSAM 273 from the draft to the final version. There's not even – I mean it's basically exactly the same. So McGeorge Bundy, he nailed it for the guy coming in, and yet the guy coming in thinks completely opposite of the guy going out. How did McGeorge Bundy know how to write that so perfectly for the guy coming in? Well, I don't know. You know, It's all speculation after that. But I think it's worth asking the question. And I know you know you and I have talked about this before, Lynn. There is one glaring item, glaring item in National Security Action Memorandum 273's draft that was left out of the final version. And it's, it's item number four. Do you recall that, Lynn? Yeah. Who doesn't after they've ever read that? Yeah. So go, <laughs> go ahead and read this. Here, here is November 21st, a draft. And uh, go ahead, Greg. Well, again, folks, keep in mind, this is very, very important. A National Security Action Memorandum is top secret. So keep this in mind, okay? Because this isn't like, this is a document that once they get back from Honolulu, it's going to go to the newspapers and everybody in the world is going to see what it says. No, no, nobody's going to see what it says. No one's going to know that they were talking about supposedly what they were supposed to be talking about, right? Right was withdrawing from Vietnam, okay? That's what they were supposed to be talking about. So it's not like they have to be worried politically that everybody's going to find out, and oh no, we're going to get blamed, and people are going to think, no, 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 this is top secret stuff. No one is going to read any of this, okay? So item number four in NSAM 273 says this. It is of the highest importance that the United States government avoid either the appearance or the reality of public recrimination from one part of it against another, and the president expects that all senior officers of the government will take energetic steps to ensure that they and their subordinates go out of their way to maintain and to defend the unity of the United States government both here and in the field. End quote. What is he talking about? What could McGeorge Bundy possibly be talking about if it's not a coup d'etat? Because, again, this is a top secret document. Why does he have to tell the people who are, who are read into this top secret document, why does he have to tell them to avoid the appearance or the reality of public recrimination from one part of the government against another. What are you talking about? Public recrimination? For what? It's a top secret document. See? What is it that the public is going to think the government's blaming other parts of the government for here? About what? About what you discussed in Honolulu that led to this document? No one even is going to know it's there. Now, now, if there's an assassination that happens tomorrow after you're done circulating this document, because this draft, as you know, was circulated among specific people throughout the government, okay, the draft, mind you, folks, on Thursday this was written up and circulated on Thursday before Kennedy's dead, okay, and then this paragraph I just read disappears by Tuesday when Johnson signs the document, that particular paragraph is gone. OK, so that paragraph was there for certain people in the government to read. And it's referring to something. And it apparently 
has nothing to do with the rest of the document or they wouldn't have taken it out. Okay? So what is he talking about when he says, I'll repeat it, it is of the highest importance that the United States government avoid either the appearance or the reality of public recrimination from one part of it against another, and the president expects that all senior officers of the government will take energetic steps to ensure that they and their subordinates go out of their way to maintain and to defend the unity of the United States government both here and in the field. What could possibly be threatening the unity of the United States government both here and in the field, McGeorge Bundy, what? What would be threatening that that went on at the Honolulu conference? Again, the conference, what they talked about there, that was all top secret. They're not running out and telling everybody, with, and this document's top secret. So what's a threat to the unity of the United States government? Why are you telling everybody to act unified and defend the unity? Because there's nothing so far that would threaten that. Well, until the next day at about 12.30 in the afternoon when JFK's brains were splattered across Dilly Plaza, now it's important to not point fingers at each other, I guess. Now the sentence and paragraph makes sense. But until that occurred, it doesn't make much sense. So that was a real eye-opener for me. Fletcher and I talked often about that, about this document and about its significance and, you know, again, you know, people sometimes will say, no, you know, that it can't mean that. Okay, well, give me, fill me in then, you know, what do you think that it means? Because I'm not attempting really to speculate here. I'm begging you. It's like somebody, can you explain this to me? You know, give me a plausible, innocuous you know, explanation for what paragraph four meant then. You tell me what it means. Because there's some key words here. Public recrimination. That, that's, you know, public? Why would there be any public anything here? The public doesn't even know what you talked about in Honolulu, right? You're sworn to secrecy. It's a top secret meeting. The public doesn't even know that you wrote NSAM 273, the draft, while you were there. It's a top secret document. Hell, the public doesn't even know about NSAM 263 from six weeks ago about withdrawing from Vietnam. That's a top secret document. See, so, so somebody please tell me, what, what was he talking about here? If you can find it, let me know. And, you know, what I mentioned in Dallas when I gave this presentation initially was that I thought maybe I was missing something. So I went digging around, you know, you try to find, you know, what they spoke about at the Honolulu conference to maybe somehow justify what's, what he wrote in this draft, you know, and... You can go to the State Department documents, the Foreign Relations of the United States, or you can go to the Gravel edition of the Pentagon Papers. There's another you know, source where you can start you know, looking for information, anything you can you know, possibly find to see if you can, can figure it out. But the State Department, you know, they have 16 pages memorialized there referring to the Honolulu Conference that we were just talking about, 16 pages. And of the 16 pages, there are only three short paragraphs where they're talking about what they were tasked to discuss in Honolulu, namely withdrawing from Vietnam, right? I mean, that's what the conference was supposed to be about, according to the cable that went out. And so the State Department has 16 pages about the conference. And if you look, there's only three times when mention of the McNamara Tiller report comes up. And if you remember, the only part the president approved from the McNamara Tiller report that he authored himself behind their backs, was the part referring to withdrawing from Vietnam. So in that whole 16 pages in the State Department Frust volume, Foreign Relations of the United States volume, there's only three paragraphs, and each one of them, yeah, refers to withdrawing from Vietnam. There's nothing here says, after long discussions, you know, it, we decided that it was a real mistake to withdraw from Vietnam. And General Taylor made a compelling argument that McNamara... You know, Defense Secretary McNamara promised he would take directly to the president and inter, you know, he would interrupt, you know, Ambassador Lodge's meeting with the president to make sure the president understands the gravity of the situation and we should not pull out from Vienna. No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that at all. It says the opposite. It says the opposite, see? So it's real interesting that um, we have... We don't have any real good documentation that I've been able to find. It might be out there, and if anybody hears this, this, this radio show and you can direct me to um, 
to it, please do, because I, I would really love to find it. But well, I, I think it means just what you think it means, okay? Yeah. So there's yeah. that. And I'll, I'll give you another little interesting tidbit how they try to obfuscate this. If you get the, um, the Foreign Relations of the United States, 1961 to 65, Volume 4, it's Vietnam, August to December, 1963, printed by the Department of State. In my book, if you go to page 340, they start with, uh, on page 336, this item 167, which is a memorandum, and it's NSAM 263 is, is built on this. And here they are, you know, one, conclusions and recommendations, right? Part B, we recommend that, you know, part C, and they go through all this. Then, then you get to page 340, and then in a, in a paragraph, you get to section one, and then it just says in brackets, here follows section two, military situation and trends, three, economic situation and trends, four, political situation and trends, five, effects on political tension, end of brackets, end of quote, and then you start with section six. So I read yeah. through that several times until I said, wait a minute, this is this is the official State Department printing, and they've just left out section two, three, four, five. Yeah. What the hell is in there that they can't print? When this right. is this supposed to be the Bible of everything that's going on there, they print. Uh, it's online, so I, I'll see if I can find this online. But it just jumps to Section 6, overall evaluation. So, you know, here follows Section. It, it's just really strange. And yeah. like, you, like you earlier mentioning, uh, they just said, we briefed the president. You know, which president, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even the Pentagon Papers does the exact same thing. Yeah. You would never know that there was a change in administration, that there was a new president. Yeah. It's, it's, uh... And if we didn't have some tidbits of information to Fletcher to say, you know, look into those things that they omitted. So what do you mean they omitted? What? And you read through it. And I, I, myself, I read through that a couple of times. I just didn't, it didn't sink in. Okay, here follows section two, three, four. Okay, the titles of them, right. Okay, section six. So I kept reading. And it yeah. just dawned on me one day, what do you mean here follows? I mean, <laughs> what's in that? Then you have to go you have to go on a real hunt to try to find those documents yeah. because uh, they don't want them out there. And, yeah, if uh, the, yeah, yeah, there's something up with it. And even if you know there may not even be anything that incriminating in the documents other than the fact that they never they never discussed Well, they don't want them public. Right? They don't want the public, or they would be. I mean, you can just on face value take it at that, right? Oh, no, I agree with you. But I mean, yeah. what I'm saying is there might not be anything incriminating. Like, put it this way sometimes what's not in a document is just as important as what is in the document. So, if the minutes of the meeting, if there were minutes of any kind, but if there's no mention of why we should recommit ourselves to Vietnam, you know, why we should change. The course that was set by Kennedy, you know, in 263, if there's no mention of why we should do it, then it's very hard to justify why he wrote this document, the draft of NSAM 273. Right. If, well, if, the if thing is, never, this yeah. is what uh, will get to the crux of it, yeah. that, that Fletcher Prouty has indicated his opinion at, that the removal of JFK, the final straw was him pulling out of Vietnam. So many presidents have opposition and enemies. Kennedy had his, but the final straw was, you know, pulling out. And uh, here's an example of how the government dealt with that, you mm -hmm. know. And, um, uh, you know, other historians may disagree with that. I know there's some, I think, Noam Chomsky and other people have said, um, you know, other people believe in the Warren Commission, you know, so it's hard to, mm -hmm. to justify that. But as I, you know, subscribe to, you know, things that Fletcher has written and, and uh, read with interest, it does appear to be that this v pulling out of Vietnam and then they tried to obfuscate it by saying Lyndon Johnson just went ahead with the utter respect to Kennedy. We did. We just fulfilled all his plans. And as right. we've been going through them, he said, no. Actually, you're doing the opposite here. He, he's saying pull out. You guys are saying we're going to help them to win. Like Fletcher said, that uh, wings in the Pentagon, they were empty and, and nothing. When he came back from the South Pole, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they were all buzzing. The things like every, we're on. The war is back on and we're, we got the funding and, and uh, you know, full speed ahead. Yeah, yeah. And that's echoed by John Judge's mother, I think, too. 
Absolutely. people who were there that, yeah. you know, are saying, listen, you know, everything was winding down and now it's back on full speed. So this is what some of these items that we're illuminating for researchers to, to go further with. But at least um, we're kind of just saying, I think there's more here. And when you read that paragraph in that in the draft of, of 273, you know, and 273 mm-hmm. is a complete reversal of any, everything Kennedy was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and you hear that, that, you know, we've got to be prepared not for one, you know, wing of the government to uh, – to blame itself, and we got to circle the wagons here, and uh, for the good of America, we're going to just cover this up somehow. Yeah, for the good of America, huh? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, for for the good of the facade, you know, and um, yeah. that's what you might call the Warren Commission, and it might have been presented to Earl Warren, you know, under all the very guises that you may say he may have accepted uh, as some kind of noble endeavor, like if we say... Lee Oswald was a communist agent. It means war with Russia. And we don't want a thermal nuclear war. There's millions will be killed. Mm -hmm. On the same token, if your enemy just came in and killed your king, or the same thing with with the mafia, if the mafia came in and just uh, killed him, why why shouldn't you send the Justice Department and the FBI Mm -hmm. and every uh, every effort and muscle that you have to -hmm. fight this? So if they really believed that Russia was behind this or Cuba, Mm -hmm. fight back. But if they mm-hmm. know there was nothing there, you know, then the whole thing is a facade. Mm-hmm. And I think in my 50 Reasons episode that we, we started off with the intro, the greatest fraud perpetrated on the American people. That might have been something uh, echoed from Richard Nixon himself. Mm-hmm. You know, I think also that – I think the war that LBJ was concerned with preventing wasn't World War Three; It was civil war, you know. I mean, you know, you look at what, what – there are certain events, let's put it that way, that have triggered riots in the streets, you know, even in, the, in uh, all over the world and in the United States as well, you know. And can you imagine that if, you know, there, you know I know you're familiar, there, the LBJ Oval Office tapes, right, and, tapes, the audio recordings. And it, um, it's still amazing to me that when you listen to the audio recording between LBJ and Hoover, where Hoover tells LBJ that the reason – that uh, Connolly was hit by a bullet was because he was in the way. Let me repeat that. For those of you who have not listened to the LBJ Oval Office tapes, you need to listen to the tapes. And in the first week following the assassination, roughly, you know, around on the, I, I don't know, I'm not sure if it was the 25th or the 27th that this conversation took place, but it's in the first week. It's not hard to find it. And Hoover tells LBJ that the reason Connolly got shot was because Connolly was in the way. Now, if the shooter, Oswald, was behind Kennedy on the sixth floor and Connolly was seated in front of Kennedy, how could Connolly have shielded Kennedy from a bullet? Because LBJ asked, would all of the bullets have hit Kennedy if Connolly wouldn't have been in the way? And Hoover says yes. Okay? So you look at that and you go, if that had somehow gotten leaked on November 29th, right? On the day that LBJ announced the formation of the Warren Commission, right? If, let's say on the 30th, you know, by Sunday or or on the 1st of December, right? Monday morning, 1st of December, New York Times headline, leaked Oval Office White House tape. Hoover says to LBJ, Connolly was hit because he was in the way of a bullet intended for JFK. Right? Evidence of a conspiracy. If this would have come out then, well, there would have just been mayhem. Well, my favorite is LBJ's first question. Were they shooting at me too? Right. Yep. Yep. But I still think, you know, if you waited two weeks after that, how about this? If a year later, after the Warren Report had come out, the lie of the Warren Report had come out, if those tapes had been leaked. Wow. Wow. See, you're talking a civil war practically in the United States. I mean, that would have been – but today, it doesn't even make the headlines. You know, we have the tapes. Nobody even pays attention. And Nobody even pays attention. There has been a well-publicized now disinformation campaign. People recognize who look into it just at what lengths uh, coming from the office of the CIA. What is it, 1035-? That document saying that – We'll use our assets in the media to keep oh, yeah. perpetrating the uh, 
you know, support of the Warren Commission and discredit those who are investigating. I mean, starting off with like Mark Lane, somebody like that, right? But, yeah. um, uh, you know, it's of interest at the Sixth Floor Museum where they get their funding from and, and their total propaganda. You know, yeah, well, it's not you know, as actually, if it's really a museum and they and they show both sides. You know, if they were saying, uh, uh, let's talk about, you know, the dinosaurs or gravity or something, you know, right. here's here's where the latest research is. And here's what people have discovered. They have to omit so many things. And um, yeah, uh, well, it, you know that I actually have that document that you were just referencing, um, 1035-960 up on my web uh, on the forum of the website so if uh, your listeners again go to the website you can uh under propaganda you'll be able to find that document where the agency describes you know methods to discredit critics of the warren report i mean can you imagine this yeah can you yeah. it's like no that's the efforts they're going to right and yeah. uh and uh fletcher proudy wrote a whole thing a whole i would call it a, an article chapter on what you're talking about, the discrepancies between NSAM 260, uh, 263 and 273. So that's on the you know, direct downloadable, yeah. on Colonel Prouty. But uh, it's very interesting. I urge everyone to watch your video that you have there because you kind of summarize it nicely. I thought you did justice to, to the research that should go on to this. It's needed. And it's not that, you know, alone Lee Oswald got these shots off. No, no, he didn't. No. Here's what happened. A wing of the American government decided to act, right? I think it comes from Alan Dulles, downhill from there, makes a call to Ed Lansdale, gets teams in there after they had unsuccessfully tried several other times to get rid of them. And I think that when the whole NASA, uh, it's astounding. I don't know if you want to talk about that right now, but NSA M271. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or, I supplied that to you. I remember years and years and years ago when I first read it, I couldn't believe it, where Kennedy was actually, um, well, you know, it's interesting that you well, bring that before up. you get if any if anyone doesn't know what we're talking about, we're talking about Kennedy decided to end the space race and yes. go jointly to the moon with the Soviets. And yes. in a nutshell, he's saying that listen, in his speech in, in the American University, we breathe the same air, we drink the same water. We've got to start getting along, and it starts with a cooperative effort between our two countries. And here's where we can have a cooperation as mankind. Let's go to the moon together. So his NSA M271 is saying, I want to report, I want you to, you know, give me a fixed date. I think you have 45 days to get back to me and show me the progress that's being made. Yeah. Well, you want to hear something interesting, though, Lynn? Go ahead, I, go ahead. Yeah. I apologize that I don't have it right in front of me, but um, Nikita Khrushchev, following our successful uh, orbiting of a man around the moon, John Glenn, Nikita Khrushchev is the person who extended that invitation first to the United States. And Kennedy accepted it. And then it took him some time before he actually had a National Security Action Memorandum written up to that effect, 271. But I didn't realize that Khrushchev had extended that first. And it's real interesting, you know, as, hardliner, as hardline as Khrushchev appeared to be at the time, he had tremendous pressure on him, you know, from his own Politburo, just like our presidents had from our own national security, uh, uh, you know, establishment on this side, um, that, you know, Khrushchev actually seemed to have been softening there towards the United States because I think Kennedy got to him. I think he believed what Kennedy was saying. He didn't believe most of the leaders of the United States, you know, the, he, he thought that we were mortal enemies. But I think he believed that there was a way towards peace and that he could work with Kennedy. And I will – I'll research that document that I just mentioned, and I will find it, and I will provide it to you along with the other one. I know you've got 271 already up on, um, on uh, uh, the Proudy.org site, but I'll research this other one and get it to you because it's fascinating – that it shows, in my opinion, it shows how the rest of the world was viewing the United States and the American president differently than it had viewed. I mean, in Eisenhower, you know, he had a, a, he had a good reputation, I mean, especially for a guy who had been in the military his whole life, you know, to, to be so committed to peace and how that got sabotaged at the end. But he was so committed to peace himself, yet he still came from this, this hardliner background, you know, that it, it, he wasn't 
that trusted by other people that were on the other side ideologically from the United States. Yeah, because, I, if you study you know, the U-2 flight and, and uh, the crusade for peace that Eisenhower was going on and some backroom uh, communication – he said, these guys sent the flight out without my okay to Khrushchev. And he said, okay, yep. if if that's true then, prove it to me. Fire Alan Dulles and those guys that are acting behind your back, and then I'll believe you, and I'll be able to let this go. And then Eisenhower went back, and he just couldn't do it. He thought, you know, maybe they did for the better or worse, but this is, you know, the CIA and, and, and everything of the American intelligence. I can't just fire them. Uh, I better just take it on the chin. And so he was softer than Kennedy. When Kennedy, mm -hmm. when they acted on the Bay of Pigs and all this other stuff behind his back and he never could trust them, he fired him. He said, mm -hmm. you know what, it's time for you guys to go. And, yeah. you know, that's, you know, maybe out of 10 steps, step nine that had him removed. And uh, yeah, like we've been talking about today, I think the withdrawal from Vietnam was the final uh, number 10 if there was 10 reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was it was huge. I mean, and you look at the um, – I think, you know, sometimes researchers get so focused on um, solving, quote-unquote, the murder mystery, you know, the murder mystery. And I think that's a real uh, – uh, not the most productive approach to this. I think a real – maybe possibly more productive approach – it kind of goes back to the French, you know, qui bono, right? Who benefited? And I'm not just talking about LBJ here, you know. I'm talking about the broader national security apparatus. I'm talking about the military industrial complex. I'm talking about banking and finance. Yeah, bank, you know, you know Sullivan Cromwell. Who, who did Alan Dulles work for? Right. And it's like you get these, the feeling that these bankers were lending money to both countries, you know, hoping they kept escalating and yeah. hoping they just kept the Cold War going. So. They lend money to America and, you know, who's in charge of the Federal Reserve. And the same thing in the Soviet Union. They keep saying, we're under attack. We better borrow more money to, to fix up our defenses. And uh, they were a poor country to start with. And as mm -hmm. we saw, they just finally went bankrupt. Well, and as we also know, that um, that huge buildup prior to the end of World War II on Okinawa of, you know, literally the largest amount of surplus uh, armaments that have ever been stockpiled in the world were on that island prior to the fall of, prior to Truman approving of the atom bomb to be dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And because originally Roosevelt thought that we were going to fight a ground war in Japan, you know, we were going to go in there and it was going to cost a tremendous amount of lives on both sides. And so the that buildup happened. And then, of course, when Roosevelt was died, Truman uh, inherited the decisions on what to do here, and he chose the route of the atom bomb. And, you know, that, that whole history is also very interesting. I, you know, I don't want to go too far off topic by going any deeper into it than, than what I'm about to say. But that surplus of, uh, of armaments was then divided basically between not, not south – Vietnam and South Korea, but North Korea and North Vietnam. And that's an amazing thing. I mean, we funded, not only did the bankers do the funding of both sides like you just mentioned, but we also supplied the materiel to the generals in the north of Vietnam. Talking about they Ho Chi Minh. Had, yeah. They had our stuff that we were going to be using against the Japanese at the end of, uh, towards the end of World War II. We ended up supplying that to Ho Chi Minh. That is a whole other topic and show. <laughs> yeah, it is, but it is actually what happened. But again, it, you know, it's very reflective of the uh, mind, you know, you, you know, you can't make this stuff up. You know, it's like George Orwell in 1984 kind of, kind of, kind of a thing, you know, where the enemy uh, changes faces every day and you forget who the enemy was and you've got a new friend today that you didn't have yesterday and the, the, the whole works there. Fletcher often pointed that out about the Soviet Union, you know, the way they became our, went from being our ally to our enemy or literally overnight, you know. But again, you're right, we're di digressing some there. But um, Well, for those new to the case, you should study uh, NSAM 263, look into yeah. the foreign relations of the United States, and I'll make a link to that. And look what people have written about it and look at this uh, different reports that went on and uh, you can actually see what Kennedy's objectives were 
and uh, see how that turned around. 180 yep. degrees with uh, the first thing Johnson signed is uh, we're going to help them to win. <laughs> Not we'll be withdrawing. Yeah. I'm going to win the contest. Help and uh, your new contest. website is uh, devoted to those kind of things. We'll probably have you on to talk about the Bay of Pigs and other things again. But uh, for those interested in this narrow bandwidth of history, but if you are interested, this is what we talk about. And, yeah. uh, and these documents we were talking about um, are all up on, um, on my website as well. And my presentations on them are on the website too and on the YouTube channel. So uh, that's also a, a spot that people can land on and, and take a look around. Sure. Okay, Greg, is, before we wrap up, is there anything else you sure. wanted to get to today? Um, well, no, I think, I think we pretty much covered it. I, uh, I'm so glad to talk to you again, Len. It's always, uh, it's always good. Um, people shouldn't take this for granted, you know, your, your good work that you do with Black Op Radio. It's show number 600 and, or 6,000, what is it now? <laughs> 671, I believe. Uh, the ultimate is 980, I think. May Brussel, I think, did 980 shows, so that's the pinnacle. There you go. Uh -huh. Yeah, yep. And, uh, yeah, that's good. I'm, I'm always well, thanks for that. Thanks on. for that. Yeah. We try to do good, and uh, we try to keep a bit of unity in the research community. Uh, we're not going to agree, and I think that even when we find somebody that we respect, we don't agree with, like I mentioned, uh, you know, whim or, you know, doesn't mean I agree with everything uh, about you or any other researcher, Jim DiEugenio or somebody. But, you know, I like to listen to everything and put it out there for everyone else to make uh, a statement and then write in an email. Uh, I mean, Jim DiEugenio handles a lot of these emails. So, I mean, people write in and, and – uh, People are really interested to hear, well, I have a question. I don't quite understand this about Lyndon Johnson or, or uh, you know, because, you know, last year there was so many books coming out saying Lyndon did it, you know, the LBJ mastermind and all that, right? And yeah. I don't subscribe to that, although who benefited, he surely benefited. I think that only helped that when these, what did you call them, the sponsors? You were talking about... Uh, well, yeah, you know, Fletcher used to refer to this group of faceless nameless people that um, as the high cabal, which is a term that he borrowed from uh, Winston Churchill. And in China, uh, they're referred to the gentry, simply as the gentry. And again, and it's taken for granted in, in Chinese culture um, that there are people above the wealthiest of the wealthy and uh, above the top of the Communist Party that you don't know who they are, but they're there. Their presence is felt in every you know, corner of society, um, and it's just taken for granted, you know, that, that this is the, the privileged elite of the elite, never named. And then you've got a, what Fletcher called the middle management when he and I talked, and then you have, of course, mechanics, which are assassins. Well, you know, George Michael Levica and Charles Drago had a model that basically is the same thing, um, slightly different names, though. The high cabal slash gentry, they refer to as the sponsors. And then the, what Fletcher would refer to as what, you know, euphemistically as middle management, they call the facilitators. And then both use the same term mechanics for the actual assassins on the ground and the operators on the ground. Um, but it's a real, you know, important model because the two most elusive uh, in that model, right, are of course the sponsors who you'll never know who they are, and the mechanics that you'll you'll never know who they are either. They're they're faceless, nameless, and nationless as well, you know. So there's a huge middle management or facilitator group that you can name all of them, you know. Um, you could name Alan Dulles or Lansdale, you know, or Angleton if you want to throw him in, or uh, you know Morales or you know all these folks. So. Um, but the the seam between the facilitator or middle management and the high cabal or sponsor, there's a seam there. And there's some, you know, there's the, the messenger boy, you know, the, the guy who can get a peek behind the curtain. It has to be. Somebody's got to be able to communicate to the facilitators, you know. And that's about probably as close as we'll ever get, you know, to, to being able to nail – to nail the participants when you look at it from that model, you know, and um, it's a, it's more uh, daunting a task when you look at it that way. 
um, you know. In, well, I think that the whole journey is the education so that um, I'm not so quick to believe an event like 9-11 when it happens, when I've studied how th disinformation has happened before, and uh, you know, you look into the Reichstag fire and that, even this uh, Boston thing has got, you know, I don't mm -hmm. have time to look into all these, so it's not like I'm into every kind of quote conspiracy. I've looked into a couple of things that held my interest, and mm -hmm. um, you know, but there's some, as soon as you start to recognize some problems in the official story, you can start to. Uh, look into that and uh I, I just there's a lot more wrong uh than people i think are ready to look into i mean they find it uncomfortable and if you think about martin luther king or bobby kennedy's assassination or that there's uh you know jim douglas's book is jfk and the unspeakable i mean it might have been at that time that for americans to consider that alan dulles and his cronies uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Bank of Boston, all those guys said, look, the guy's got to go, get rid of him, and that's it's done. It's uncomfortable for them to think. In fact, it was unspeakable. That mm -hmm. they, what? It wasn't that lone nut? And uh, mm -hmm. that's I think it's the education you come away with when you find so many facts. I mean, you can – we made 50 reasons, but if you could just hold up um, Commission Exhibit 399 and just say, well, wait mm -hmm. a minute. No, there's no way. You're lying. Now, mm -hmm. what else are you lying about? And you just start going through reason number two, number three, number four. But, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. this Cold War, big, big money, and who's lending the money, you know, to keep it going? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's astounding to me right now with uh, uh, you talk about the the uh, fiscal cliff even and America just borrowing more money. But the, uh, the military is just – it's untouchable, and then it's a black budget. People don't even know how much money is being spent on these things, and uh, – they have no money for education and food, but they've always got enough for another aircraft carrier or something. It's just like, mm -hmm. uh, it's if you don't get a hold of it, you're just going to wake up one day like the Soviet Union, completely fractured and uh, bankrupt. And it, uh, well, you know, and a, a lot of these things have a signature to them. You know, um, some of these other questionable events that you've uh, that you've brought up here, and I, and like you, I don't have the time nor the resources to investigate everything that bears the signature of disinformation. Um, but there certainly are uh, a lot of them that do. Um, you know, and not to say that I believe that everything is conspiratorial, but, you know, it, it, that's also a very clever, uh, you know, a clever act, uh, it, it, it's not act, but a, a clever, well, what's the right word? distraction perhaps is to treat the word conspiracy like it's the exception to the rule <laughs> well it's not folks yeah like that Shermer did he he and then he said we're going to infiltrate the research community to to make them look ridiculous right well yeah. what do you have time to do that for why don't you do spend time on proving a case and if uh, they ever anyone proved a case I mean uh like Jim DiEugenio did a masterful job just ripping apart Bugliosi's book. I mean, page by page, word by word, showed him to be a, a fraud, and uh, he didn't even write half the book, and nobody believes it. So mm -hmm. that's the good thing that, uh, you know, uh, Tom Hanks' miniseries or, or just episode Parkland was a complete flop, and everybody who did – any most of the people who watched it, you know, without, without the um, – the diehards, the McAdams, uh, the people who have drank the Kool-Aid, and uh, no matter what cost, they're going to continue to support the Warren Commission. Good luck with all that. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, we don't have a uh, – it, it'd be interesting to be able to count up the, the various things that uh, are put out there that are provably false with just a little bit of research, you know, it's, <laughs> it's amazing. And the Kennedy case really stands out, you know, yeah. that like you said, it's 50 reasons is the tip of the iceberg. Although the 50 that you hit are, are key ones. They're just, they're very, very powerful. But, uh, cause again, nobody has the opportunity, not nobody, but the majority of people don't have the opportunity to be able to investigate further, but there's so much wrong with it. It's just, the time. it's like everywhere you turn, it's like, what's wrong with this? What's wrong? It's, it's, there's problems everywhere in it, you know? I mean, in the, if a person can bear to read the Warren Report, it's just the, oh my, oh my. You know, you get into the volumes and it's like, oh my, are you kidding? The, the unbelievable, uh, they were so remiss 
in not asking proper questions, in leading witnesses, in forcing testimony out of people that, that is just, I mean, Arlen Specter. Changing witness testimony, you know. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, the whole thing is a fraud. It's um, so I'm gonna. Yeah. We should leave it because I think we're starting to ramble now. But uh, you I know, know I recommend <laughs> anything that Fletcher Prouty has written, uh, yeah. Jim Douglas, uh, yeah. Jim DiEugenio, Mark Lane. Um, the the books last year and and at at my web page, I have uh, at Black Op Radio uh, I have Len's favorites. So just browse mm-hmm. through those. What you know, my favorite books are. And, uh, you know, um, but the there's many, brother. there's many good ones. I mean, you know, there are some bad ones, and uh, there are the ones who say that, um, uh, you know, like Roger Stone said, LBJ did it, and that's that. But you know, it's one thing to say that, but you have to kind of omit so much other evidence that's saying, well, it doesn't end with LBJ, and it didn't start with him. He was, uh, in my opinion, you know, only they knew he'd be only too happy to go along with it. He hated the Kennedys. Well-known fact, if other guys sat around and said he's got to go, I don't think it's LBJ who had the uh, – uh, well, I'll leave it at that. I'll just leave it yeah, at yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think that um, you know, we, for certain there's no doubt that both uh, LBJ, J. Edgar Hoover, and Alan other Dulles. individuals that can be named in the FBI and the agency were up to their necks in the cover-up. I mean that is ex- – yeah. Easily demonstrable by anybody studying, you know, their first year in law. How about this? Their first year in common sense. You don't even need to be studying law. And it's demonstrable that they were involved in obstruction of justice. And in fact, Gerald Ford admitted to it. And he didn't say, I was guilty of obstruction of justice. But he admits that he changed the wording in the report to move the back wound up to the neck so that it would be more consistent with the single bullet theory. More plausible. Well, yeah, but he so, admitted, he, yeah, admitted yeah. he did it. I mean, that's tantamount to obstruction of justice. And in American jurisprudence, right, when you are tampering with evidence, you see, that's almost tantamount to being guilty for the crime that you're obstructing justice on. See, that's, that they're all, they go so hand in hand. Why would you be obstructing justice? Oh, that's right. I forgot. It was to prevent World War III. That's right. That's right. <laughs> My bad. I forgot. See, well, no, that's not what happened, folks. That's not what happened. But we all know that. So. Okay, Greg. Well, thanks for spending time today. All uh, right, Lynn. Thank you. I'll make links to your uh, new site and, of course, uh, any old work that you've done. And uh, be glad to have you on again. I think we should talk about some more of these things that may be ancient history to some people, but uh, a lot of pe- new people are coming on Black Op Radio these days. I think since last November and that Oliver Stone was on the show, he tweeted that he was on the 50 Reasons, and I've just noticed a big spike of interest at Black Op Radio from uh, from Great. people. So that's... Uh, yeah, well, you know, and also our forum, I think, is going to be something... Again, your listeners will have, have a special invite button. Everybody recall... Go to assassinationofjfk.net, scroll to the bottom of the page on the right side, the big orange button that says private invite for BOR listeners. Click on that, and it will transport you to the forum. You've got an early invitation prior to our launch. And again, the contributors that are the founding members there include myself, uh, Dr. John Costella, Dr. David Mantic, Charles Drago, Phil Dragoo, uh, uh, Douglas Horn, uh, David Mantic. So there'll be a lot of good information from the medical evidence, the Zapruder film, and everything in between. So uh, we're, we hope to have a good, lively discussion there as well. All right. Thanks very much for being a guest on Black Op today. Thank you, Len. Have a good one. All right. Okay. Good night. Good night. Was uh, you have a link there to your good uh, review of uh, National Security Action Memorandum 263 and 273, which you gave in Dallas, I believe, at a COPA at 2010. And uh, I thought it was very well done, and I thought we should talk about that again today. Um, you know, the, the good thing about this, the, the good thing is that a few other forums and that have been kind of infiltrated by people who are alone. Uh, assassin, you know, uh, proponent or whatever, you know, like just a, uh, uh, you know, th- these two worlds don't 
intersect anywhere, you know? It's like, yeah. if you believe the Warren Commission, you've got to sit with your own little circle of friends because the people who don't believe it, what we're doing is we're investigating the failings of it and to see what we can discover from this investigation. So as people have looked into acoustical evidence or, or x-rays or medical evidence or the root or all the different people who investigated it, they've already said, listen, it's a given. There's something wrong with the Warren Commission, and we don't believe a lone gunman uh, can shoot. I mean, you you know, killed off, you know, he's pointing from the front. You know, how, how can you get hit from the back from the front? You know, was a great quote from that day, I think. Yes. So um, people have got a given that something wrong happened, and it's our investigation of, of how the media has perpetrated this continuation of the fraud i think of the fraud of the warren commission which uh, led me to make the 50 reasons video that i i did last year i mean it was week after week another episode just showing on the 50th anniversary how it can't be true now among the researchers uh, some things we don't agree with and it's a real shame that some people use this as a rallying cry to i don't know fragment the community me and you have discussed many things, and we may agree or disagree, and we just say, leave it. Hmm, well, I'll have to look into that further. But um, mm -hmm. other people have said, well, if you don't agree with this, for instance, if you don't agree with this photo, then, you know, forget you. And I was just making a reference to the, the people who are in the Oswald is Innocence campaign. It's like their whole campaign is, listen, everybody in the community uh, pretty well feels that Oswald is innocent. I don't know why you have to kind of fragment the community, say you're either with us on this thing or you're against us, right? And I think that's a real failing. COPA and, and the, the lecture you gave, I think a lot of us are really trying to say, listen, if you're interested in this, here is the information we have discovered. And through Fletcher Prouty or other people, this is what is the groundwork for it. So let's go forward. Mm -hmm. um, the, that's the good thing with your website. I think the only failing is that if we have too many forums – It'll be, I don't think people will know where to go. Now, the one good one was Rich De La Rosa, which you, for years, were with, with him. He's passed away now. But that's a forum that uh, all sorts of people uh, of, of many varying views went to. Lately, there was the John Simkin Forum, and yet somehow they have allowed people in that want to, you know, parrot that the Warren Commission was correct. And it's almost as if it's a kind of a time-wasting thing. They should just have, here's a forum. If you believe Lee Oswald was guilty and, you know, the Warren Commission was correct, well, the you know, the three or four of you can go there and pat each other in the back. But for the hundreds and thousands of people who don't agree, it's as if these guys are just there to infiltrate these forums and, and muddy the waters. And in the case of McAdams, he'll have a blatant lie. He's just lying, and people will correct him. And, he, oh, yeah, you're correct. Okay. And then months later, he goes back to the same old lie. Sure, yeah. Well, you know something? I did decide to uh, announce on your show today, and now that you've kind of brought up forums, I guess I'll go ahead and do that. I did start a forum as well connected to the website. And what we're going to do, in fact, we'll do right now, is add a button just for your listeners, because I haven't launched the forum officially yet, but just for your listeners, if you go to assassinationofjfk.net website, go ahead and scroll down to the bottom of the opening page, and on the bottom right side, you'll see, I guess it'll be an orange button, and it's going to say something to the effect of private invitation for BOR listeners only. And that way, just the folks that are listening to this program will know that the button's there. Other people will see it. They won't know what it means, though. But it'll say private invitation and click on that button because there's not a button on the top of the forum yet. You know, I mean, on top of the website that says forum yet because we haven't officially launched. So listeners, just scroll to the bottom of the page, right side. There'll be a button that says for Black Op Radio, you know, private invitation. Click on that. That'll bring you to the forum. And then you can sign in there. And you can uh, read what we've already got going. You can post to it as well. I do ask that everyone use their real name. We don't accept aliases, you know, or screen names of any kind. Your, your, your true first and last name, as well as a valid email address. Would, you know, it, yeah, would, I would, think on the Simkin form, you had to have a photo as well, which... You know, I yeah. remember there was some problems with David Von Peen or those guys. They didn't want to give a photo. They didn't want to give their real name. It's like, listen, if you want to come in here and talk to scholars, people who are spending time really going over this, at least use your real name or go play in somebody else's sandbox, you know? Right. There you go. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> yeah, well, we've, we've already got quite a bit up on the forum. I should also mention that uh, we have some very good founding members that decided that they would go with me on this journey and uh, assist me. The founding members are John Costello, of course, the physicist from Australia, Charles Drago, a good friend of mine, who's a very articulate speaker as well as a, has some very deep political insights to offer to the case. He worked a lot with the late Evika. Also, Phil Dragu, who, you know, if you recall, uh, JFK used to quote and say that uh, where power corrupts, poetry cleanses. And uh, Phil Dragu is a wonderful artist and a wonderful poet, as well as a very insightful individual regarding political assassinations. So he is also a founding member. Phil Giuliano, as well, from the old Rich Della Rosa Forum, who is also a founding member there, has joined us as well. So I really am anxious to hear what he has to say. Douglas Horn, everyone's familiar with, I'm sure, as well. He was the chief analyst for military records for the Assassinations Record Review Board. He's one of our founding members, as well as Dr. David Mantic, a good friend of mine. And another good friend, Stan Wilburn, who's also acting as our webmaster and has so much to contribute. He was also on the Rich De La Rosa site. So between those founding members, we've got a lot going as well. And a lot of other folks have already started to join. We're sending out private invitations, and now we've opened it up to the uh, Black Op Radio listeners. And we'll be fully launched, hopefully, in the next week, eh, maybe a week, roughly, from now. So, so that's the forum. So, uh, and, you know, you made some good points about it as well. You know, one of the, the things on our forum that's a bit different, when we started the JFK Research Assassination Forum with Rich back in 1998 because the internet was so new and because people, you know, a, a lot of folks, when they were polled, obviously did not believe the Warren report from the very beginning. I mean, it's never had a, close to a majority of people believing in it. But there was not a way that was easily accessible for people to actually research the subject themselves. Unless you had a real passion for it, you'd have to spend hours and hours at a library. If you really wanted to get to, into the nitty gritty, you'd have to, you know, perhaps even travel to Washington, D.C. to the National Archives to, act, you know, to do some really in-depth research. And a lot of people just did not have the research sources for this and did not have reasonable access. So when the internet first was born and people were getting on all these different, you know, chat rooms and news groups and this and that and the other, there was a whole lot of, you know, chaos and mayhem going on there, a lack of decorum, for lack of a better word. So one of the things that Rich had done when he built the forum, and we enforced this for the entire years that it was open, was that it was quote unquote, a no flame zone, meaning that no personal attacks were allowed. Well, of course, I've adopted that on the new forum. A person can come, share their research, and not have to be afraid that they're going to be subject to undue ridicule or criticism. Obviously, we don't want people on there just patting everybody's back. So, you know, it's fine to challenge people's findings and theories as long as it's done in a respectful way. And the other thing that's important, I think, now that 16 years has passed, you know, in terms of, of the internet being very accessible to, to people since our first forum, we don't find it necessary to even entertain the idea or argument of Lee Harvey Oswald or anyone else for that matter as quote unquote the lone assassin. So back 16 years ago, it was appropriate to allow that debate to go and uh, things like that. So do sign up for that. It's on the main page, everyone. Now with yourself, you have a new website that you've been working on. Let's um, promote that and tell me a little bit about it. Sure. And, you know, I want to make one comment, too, on, uh, on, on Twitter, what you just mentioned. You know, I was always reluctant to, to do anything with social media, and I haven't done anything personally with social media. But I think it's important for us, um, quote unquote, older researchers to remember that we do need the participation of young people in this effort, because as uh, we get older and as some of us pass on, if there's nobody left to carry the torch, well, then the torch just goes out. So I think it's important. And, and young people do communicate with each other and to the world um, through these different you know, social media outlets. So I think it's good that you do have the Twitter account. And I do as well now for the website. We've got a Facebook account, Twitter account, and a YouTube channel. Uh, Google Plus, Google Circles, and things like that. So, you know, it's a little bit strained for, for somebody in my generation maybe to always uh, be all over that, but I think it's something that's necessary if we want to involve the next generation. Speaking of which, um, the new website is assassinationofjfk.net. You don't need a www before that, just HTTP. Um, and it is uh, my new website. Um, it is loaded with information. Uh, uh, as you know, Len, um, my study 
revolved uh, a lot around, obviously, the JFK administration. Um, and uh, a big part of it had to do with his management of crisis. Um, so the Bay of Pigs is prominently uh, discussed on uh, my website, uh, including some of the presentations that I've done on the subject and uh, the information, of course, that I gleaned from the late Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty, who was a, a uh, extremely rich source of information, somebody who was there and uh, so who knew who, who, what he was talking about. And my other big focus, of course, is the Vietnam War and the National Security Action Memorandums that JFK had written that was going to extricate us from that, uh, that mess that was going on there. So that's also prominently featured, as well as many uh, articles written by some very fine researchers like uh, Doug Horn. Uh, we've also got a YouTube channel there featuring uh, uh, John Costello's work on the Zapruder film. Uh, among others, so there's uh, a lot, a lot of stuff going on, and also a lot of interviews that I conducted with uh, Jerry Hemming, the late Jerry Hemming, Jerry Patrick Hemming, and uh, that's all featured there as well. So uh, it'd be great if people would uh, visit. And there's a comment section under all of the various articles and things, so people can participate and give their input and uh, and whatnot. So that's a brand new, uh, brand new website. Okay, great. Well, one of the things I did want to discuss today... This is Mark Lane. This is Robert Groden. This is Dick Russell. This is Jim Mars. This is Dr. David Mantic. This is Cyril Weck. This is Jim DiEugenio. This is Joan Mellon. This is Jerry Polycott. This is Gary Schell. This is Greg Burnham. This is Gerald McKnight. This is Sherry Feaster. This is Doug Horn. This is Bill Pepper. This is Richard Belzer. This is Oliver Stone. This is Governor Jesse Ventura, and you're listening to Black Op Radio. Video computers online. Archiving 44K. T minus 30 seconds. Server connection confirmed. T minus 25 seconds. Live stream, you 20K. T minus 20 seconds. Phone lines are go. T minus 15 seconds. Satellite right now, point verified. T minus 10 seconds. Flight check complete. Satellite right now, point verified. Five. Welcome to Black Op Radio, the voice of political conspiracy research. You're listening to Black Op Radio, the show NSA doesn't want you to hear. Now here is your host, Leno Sanic. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Black Op Radio. This is your host, Len Osanek. Today, we are joined by noted researcher Greg Burnham from San Diego. Hello, Greg. Hi, Len. How are you? Great to uh, hear from you again. I understand it's always sunny in San Diego. It rains a lot in Vancouver, so I always envy talking to people living in these great locations. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I wish I could take credit for it, but I can't. We were... Uh commenting how, how warm it's been here even for san diego it's been relatively warm so we're very fortunate great now what i'd like to do today is talk about some of the things that are new and uh i'll start off with one thing new at black op radio is a twitter feed uh i am signed up for twitter now so if you want to follow uh get updates from whatever news is happening at black op radio you can do that you can also subscribe to an email list which i send out for only I don't send it out very often because I hate getting junk email but if I have you know something special like Oliver Stone or some new video or something I'll put that out but I guess there'll be weekly announcements you know on the Twitter feed of who's on and 